Welcome to OSU Bites from the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences Extension at The Ohio State University. I'm Anna, and today I will be explaining oak wilt. Oak wilt is a serious and often deadly vascular disease of oak trees. The disease grows and spreads through the tree and the sapwood, plugging the water conducting vessels with the pathogen's body, or the mycelium. All oaks are susceptible to oak wilt. Oaks in the red oak family are extremely susceptible and can die within a few weeks after infection. Oaks in the white oak family are more tolerant and may survive one to two years after infection. The white oak family does not show many symptoms of oak wilt. However, the red oak family shows distinct symptoms of this disease. Symptoms include defoliation in the upper canopy where flagging may occur. Flagging is when whole branches turn red to brown in color. Other symptoms include yellow to brown leaf edges, dead areas on leaves, whole leaf death, leaf drop, and fungus mats underneath the dying bark on the infected trees. Infections that occur in late spring creates wilting in mid to late summer. Black streaking underneath bark on stems may occur in both oak families. Oak wilt symptoms are commonly confused with other plant issues including drought, construction damage, insect attack, wood decays, and anthracnose. Visual diagnosis cannot be made. For confirmative diagnosis, plant samples must be completed through specialized laboratories. The pathogen spreads from disease to healthy trees by transmission of above ground and underground factors. Above ground spread consists of 10% of the total spread in oak wilt. The main route of above ground spread involves sap feeding beetles in the oak bark beetle. These beetles are attracted by the chemicals transmitted from the fungal mats underneath the bark. Once the beetles are in the mat, the beetles pick up the fungal spores and carry them to other places. Freshly wounded trees also attract these beetles from the smell of the fresh sap. Below ground spread consists of 90% of the total spread of oak wilt through root grafts. This occurs from above ground spread to oak trees. As oak wilt transmits through the whole tree, including penetrating the root system, the diseased tree root system spreads to healthy trees via common root systems. Any fresh wound promotes an entrance for pests, including pruning practices. Drought may promote oak wilt infections or worsen infections. Oak wilt is controlled and managed through a preventative approach by interfering with the disease cycle. Overland spread can be interrupted by restricting tree wounds and pruning between April 15th to October 1st. If pruning is necessary during this time, wound dressing needs to be applied to wounds with latex paint to deter beetles from landing and penetrating wounds. Underground spread can be interrupted by physically separating infectious oak wilt root systems with healthy oak tree root systems. This can be accomplished through trenching and cutting through the soil with a trencher or vibratory plow using five foot blades. Between trenching and plots, apply Lysol or a 20% bleach solution to reduce disease spread. Trenching must be performed prior to the infected trees being cut for removal to avoid possible water stress that may trigger underground spread of oak wilt. If this cannot be performed, the wood can be split for firewood. However, since this strategy does not require debarking, the firewood still may have oak wilt spores and fungal mats. To decrease potential spread of oak wilt and firewood, place the wood in stacks covered with 4mm plastic tarp through winter. 
seal the tarp to the ground to prevent beetles from accessing the piles. At the end of the season, the wood can be safely uncovered and disposed of as preferred. Chemical treatments are not recommended for the red oak family due to the low resilience. The white oak family, if treated early on in the infection stages, may result in delay of symptoms and tree death. The systemic fungicide, Elmo, is scientifically proven to delay symptoms of oak belt, but is not a curative for the disease. This product can be used as a trunk injection, injected directly into the sapwood on root flares just under the soil line. Treatments shall be applied every 12 to 36 months. Further content on this topic may be found on the link below or by visiting Ohio State Ohio Line Oakville. Welcome to OSU Bites from the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences Extension at The Ohio State University. I'm Anna and today I will be explaining gypsy moth in Ohio landscapes. Gypsy moths are large flightless moths that arrived in Boston, Massachusetts in 1889 from Asia since invaded many regions of North America and have been recorded affecting large numbers of oaks and other tree species throughout their range. Gypsy moths have colonized Ohio on two fronts, spreading from Pennsylvania in the east and from Michigan in the northwest. Today, gypsy moth can be found mostly in the northern and eastern counties of Ohio and is largely absent in southern Ohio. Gypsy moths can defoliate trees and larvae heavily feed on leaves of 300 forest trees, including oaks, maples, hickories, birch, and aspen. Severe defoliation over consecutive years on trees can lead to the increased stress, secondary pest, and tree mortality. Mortality of forest trees cause gaps in the forest canopy increasing the temperature and amount of sunlight that reaches the forest floor, which can be damaging for shade-adapted understory plants. Widespread defoliation can also have negative impacts on wildlife. Defoliation of oak trees decreases acorn production, which is an important food supply for many animals, including deer and wild turkey. Deciduous trees that are affected from gypsy moth feeding may suffer from dieback if feeding occurs for three years. Evergreen trees, however, may die in one year if defoliation is severe. Gypsy moths overwinters eggs, which are encased in a tan to dark brown hard egg mass, cemented to trees or other objects. Each egg mass may contain 1,000 eggs. Eggs are laid in the summer and will hatch in the following spring. Upon hatching, the first instar larva, if it is not on a preferred host plant, may spin a silken strand and go ballooning in the wind, an act that will carry it potentially long distances to a suitable host and even to a new geographic area. The unflighted females are large white moths which climb up the trunks of trees and give off pheromones to attract males for mating. The males fly during the day, locate females, and after mating, eggs are laid on trunks, branches, and other nearby stationary objects. Defoliated trees in the landscape should be irrigated during summer months. This may benefit from the application of a slow-release fertilizer. Other cultural care such as installation of a mulch ring should be implemented. 
Gypsy moths are also managed on a large scale by implementing slow the spread programs and limiting movement of firewood or objects such as ladders, mobile homes, lawn furniture, and equipment that may contain egg masses. When population densities are high, the safest and most effective tool for preventing widespread defoliation is aerial applications of an insecticide derived from the naturally occurring bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, commonly known as Bt. Bt sprays can also be used for gypsy moth management in single trees at the landscape level. Bt is safe to all other animals including bees and other insects, birds, pets, and humans. Landscape trees infested with larvae can also be treated with applications of other registered products as needed. Natural enemies include insect parasites that attack egg and caterpillar stages, predators such as birds and disease organisms. Several of these natural control agents occur in Ohio and may add to suppression of gypsy moth especially in forested areas. In urban systems, on a limited basis, it is possible to use mechanical removal of egg masses using vacuums to manage gypsy moth. Further content on this topic may be found on the link below or by visiting Ohio State Ohio Line, Gypsy Moth in Ohio Landscapes. OSU Bites from the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences Extension at The Ohio State University. I'm Anna, and today I will be explaining soil testing for Ohio lawns, landscapes, fruit crops, and vegetable gardens. Most soils grow best with soil pH levels between 6.0 to 6.5. The pH levels tell how acidic the soil is. pH of 7 is considered a neutral soil, while pH levels above 7.0 are considered basic, and pH levels below 7.0 are acidic. Nitrogen levels are important for plant growth. Phosphorus is an important and healthy root growth and promotes blooming and potassium is important with the encouragement of healthy cell walls and water regulation. When working with soil and plants, you should consider the industry approved standard practices, the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, which is a private nonprofit organization that oversees and develops standards for the private sector in the U.S. Recommendations of ANSI standards specific to soil testing include soil testing should be done prior to designing, plant selection, planting, and or developing management plans for landscapes. All soils and or foliar nutrient analysis should be used to determine the need, formulation, and rate of fertilizer. And when new plants are specified, they should be tolerant of the native soil pH. A soil test will determine the nutrient status of your soil and provide the necessary information to maintain optimal fertility. Test results and recommendations help protect our environment by discouraging the overpopulation of plant nutrients. 
excess nutrients not used by plants may escape into groundwater, streams, and lakes where they can contribute to environmental problems such as algae blooms. Soil testing should be performed every two to three years to maintain soil fertility. Soil can be sampled any time of the year if the soil is workable, but is recommended in fall for making lime applications to raise soil pH, and in spring for sulfur applications to lower soil pH. When collecting soil for soil testing, you can perform a soil test yourself by buying a soil test kit, but the kit will not have recommendations on fertilizers as soil analysis testing does. When collecting soil for soil sampling, take a bucket and round point or trowel. Dig three to six inches in depth where the roots are. Place and mix all soil subsamples in a clean bucket. Submitting a composite sample reduces the influence of soil fertility variations. Five to 10 subsamples are sufficient for small areas and 10 to 15 subsamples are recommended for larger areas, including lawn. Samples should be taken in a random zigzag pattern over the entire area, and all samples should be taken at the same depth and volume. Additional soil tests should be performed in areas that receive different soil fertility programs, soil color variation, and different plant species. Do not include the organic matter on the top of the soil because the organic matter can alter the soil test results. Prior to collecting the composite soil samples, contact the soil testing lab of your choice. The soil testing lab will provide a complete set of instructions. When preparing soil samples for submission to soil labs, it is important to follow the directions fully that the labs provide. Break up the clumps of soil and air dry the soil on parchment paper at room temperature. Mix soil and remove any roots or other materials from the soil sample. Remove one to two cups of soil from the composite sample and place into the sample bag associated with the soil testing kit provided by the soil lab of choice. There are various soil tests that are available per testing lab, including measuring levels of pH, phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium. These are considered the four most important parameters that growers should be aware of to maintain healthy soil. Further content on this topic may be found on the link below or by visiting Ohio State Ohio Line Soil Testing for Ohio Lawns, Landscapes, Fruit Crops, and Vegetable Gardens. OSU Bites from the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences Extension at The Ohio State University. I'm Anna, and today I will be explaining pruning and care of tree wounds. Tree trimming is more than getting rid of dead limbs. It helps the tree grow new, healthy branches. When trees are wounded from ice, windstorms, and mechanical damages, the newly exposed tissues are susceptible to pathogens and insects that may infect the tree, resulting in unhealthy and unsafe trees. Pruning is needed to maintain healthy and aesthetically appealing trees by removing dead limbs and poor structure. Pruning
think it's important to protect others from potentially hazardous limbs. Hanging limbs can fall and cause damage or injury, and it's best to remove these limbs right away. While looking for limbs to be removed, think about the dying, dead, damaged, and diseased limbs. These limbs take priority for removal. Besides getting rid of unwanted limbs, pruning can direct growth in ways we do want. When you prune a limb, your tree will grow new limbs in different directions, and that helps develop a strong branching structure. Pruning also helps the tree produce more fruit and flowers. Scaffold branches are the main lateral branches of the trunk. These branches emerge from various angles and may determine to what degree to prune each branch. For branches at a 90 degree angle with the trunk are structurally weak branches with tight V crotches. Scaffold branches with 90 to 180 degree angles are moderate to strong branches and are not as susceptible to decay as the 90 degree angled branches are. Many times, people only make one pruning cut. This may lead to a rip or tear on the trunk. This is detrimental to the tree, opening the door for decay, insects, and disease. The recommended pruning technique is called the three-point cut. The first cut is made about one foot from the tree trunk, cutting from the underside of the branch about one-third of the branch's diameter upward through the branch. This cut is phrased the undercut. The second cut is made on the top of the branch, away from the undercut, slicing all of the way through the branch. This cut is named the top cut. Now what is left is a branch stub. If the branch stub is left, the tree cannot seal off the wound and will cause decay. To prevent this, the final cut must be made by cutting the branch just along the branch bark ridge, allowing for optimal healing after the pruning cut has been made. A good indication that you have made a proper pruning cut is the latter callus formation, forming a complete circular seal around the perimeter of the cut. Callus formation seals off the wound and protects the wound against decay insects, and disease penetration. There are many ways to enhance callus formation, with the overall message to keep the tree healthy, including maintaining optimal soil nutrients, applying organic matter to the soil, and not over applying fertilizer, always using a slow release product. Prevention of tree wounds also originates from maintaining a resilient tree by providing optimal soil nutrients, but also supplying enough space for the tree to reach maturity. Oftentimes a plant is planted in an area too small for the final maturity and outgrows the area below and above ground space, which may deter growth and make the tree more susceptible to pests. If you cannot change the tree's location, add mulch to the tree's root zone. This will not only decrease lawn mower and equipment damage to the tree, but also increases microbial activity, root growth, and overall plant health. Further content on this topic may be found on the link below or by visiting Ohio State Ohio Line Pruning and Care of Tree Wounds. Welcome to OSU Bites from the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences Extension at The Ohio State University. I'm Anna, and today I will be explaining Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, Managing a Non-Native Invasive Pest in Ohio. 
Eastern hemlock is one of the giant evergreen trees that is native to northeastern North America. They thrive in moist, cool environments and may grow to be over 100 feet tall with a basal diameter greater than 5 feet. This tree grows relatively slow and some trees have exceeded an age of 1,000 years in native forest. The tree is found in cool woodland settings from Nova Scotia across to Wisconsin and in the Appalachian Mountain Range to the northern part of Alabama. Hemlock habitats host 100 bird species and the fallen needles provide moist habitats for thousands of invertebrates and moisture needing salamanders and newts. The leaf litter and roots help filter rain and snow water and the dense canopies help moderate water temperatures in nearby streams and bodies of water. On the Appalachian Plateau in southern and eastern Ohio, hemlock is considered a foundation species in the forest ecosystems where it occurs. Eastern hemlock is also a popular landscape tree where moist soils exist. In such landscapes, the trees can also withstand pruning and shaping. Naturally occurring pests of hemlocks rarely cause major tree health issues in native stand areas. However, the hemlock woolly adelgid, an aphid-like insect native to East Asia, was inadvertently introduced into the United States from Japan and now causes widespread decline and mortality of trees. Hemlock woolly adelgid attacks eastern and Carolina hemlock species. Hemlock woolly adelgid uses its needle-like stylets to pierce the base of hemlock needles where plant juices are extracted. This feeding often causes tree stress and needle loss, which can eventually lead to tree death. Hemlock woolly adelgid populations explode rapidly each spring as the females undergo two egg-laying cycles asexually, that is without males being needed. This pest overwinters as partially mature females that rapidly finish their development by March. Upon maturing, each female begins to secrete waxy threads into which she deposits her 50 to 150 eggs. The white cotton ball-like structures are called ovisacs and are one of the most visible evidence of hemlock woolly adelgid presence. Upon hatching, the tiny nymphs, called crawlers, move to the bases of needles or the bark of last year's twigs, inserting their sucking mouth parts and feed. They rapidly progress through four nymphal instars and reach adulthood again by late May into early June. These spring generation females may develop wings, being more common when they are crowded or not. The winged forms fly away in search of a spruce host, but no suitable spruce host is present in North America, so the females die. The remaining wingless females lay eggs usually less than 50 eggs per female. When these eggs hatch, the crawlers creep to the bases of new hemlock needles, but enter a dormancy period for the rest of the summer. In late September into October, these dormant nymphs resume feeding and slowly develop through their four instars during mild periods. Hemlock woolly adelgids appear to disperse by crawlers, being blown to nearby trees or on the legs of birds or on the fur of animals that are moving through infested trees. The hemlock woolly adelgid may spread 15 to 20 miles per year in warmer temperatures and 8 miles per year in colder temperatures. Hemlock woolly adelgid is managed at different governmental levels depending on the state. In states that are designated as generally infested, government agencies are usually involved with releasing and encouraging biological controls mainly small beetle predators. In these states, individual property owners that have hemlock trees in their landscapes can choose to treat the trees themselves or to hire professionals to apply treatments. 
A well-timed application of a systemic insecticide can rid a tree of an infestation for two to three years. In states where the hemlock woolly adelgid is not generally present, quarantine and eradication programs may be in place. Currently in Ohio, three small infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid have been reported and confirmed. Since confirmations of hemlock woolly adelgid in Ohio by the Ohio Department of Agriculture and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, these agencies have begun the process of establishing biological controls. They also perform regular inspections and request reports of new suspected infestations. If isolated infestations are found, these are often eradicated. The Ohio State University Extension continues to work with their state partners on this emerging issue to save eastern hemlocks. You can help by scouting March through June when the ovisacs produced by overwintered females and spring generation females are most easily detected. Scouting should be performed regularly and knowing the specific symptoms of hemlock woolly adelgid helps with this early detection. Early detections can help slow the spread of this invasive pest. If you're interested in planting a hemlock, make sure your new tree is not from an Ohio Department of Agriculture regulated area. Inspect any new tree by looking for signs of a hemlock woolly adelgid infestation. If you are traveling to a hemlock woolly adelgid infested area, make sure you properly sanitize anything that may have been in contact with infested trees. Do not transport hemlock branches, lumber, with bark, or cones. If you discover hemlock trees that have hemlock woolly adelgids, contact the Ohio Department of Agriculture for help to confirm any infestation. Further content on this topic may be found on the link below or by visiting Ohio State Ohio Line, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, Managing a Non-Native Invasive Pest in Ohio. Music